Greetings AP Calculus BC students, Mr. Record here for our eighth video in our topic 9.7 all about polar and calculus. We're nearing the end of our intervention with polar and trigonometric uh, perspectives only and in our next videos we are going to look specifically at what you can do in terms of calculus with this particular polar idea. Now we're going to take a look at a, a little bit more complicated polar curve. Not that I'm drowning in this one. It's not that it's going to be that difficult. But a rose is a rose is a rose. It's quite often seen on the AP exam in a multiple choice question that a student may be asked to find the area of a petal um, or the entire collection of petals, let's say, of a rose curve in polar. And so because of that, it's going to be pretty important that you have a bit of an understanding about what a rose curve truly looks like. So we're going to take a look at our first rose in example eight. And like I said, you may have seen this already in your trick class, but it's certainly going to be a good review nonetheless. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to move me out of the way just a little bit up there. And then we're going to take a look at this. And it says, uh, sketch the graph of the polar equation r equal 3 cosine 3 theta on the given polar coordinate plane. Now, what I would typically tell students to do if you're not quite sure and you need to get some information down, nothing is wrong with putting together a table of values like a t chart. But you want to be careful because t charts can be very time consuming. So let's see what this looks like. I'm going to put a theta value in that column and an r value. Now, be aware of the fact that that is opposite of how a normal polar point is presented. The r would come first and the theta would come second. But when we try to set up this uh, table, the theta is going to act as our independent variable. We're going to plug those in and let r be the output. So. What you're going to do is pick the easiest value of theta possible, which is a 0. And so 3 times the cosine of 3 times 0, which of course is 0, gives us this. And we know that the cosine of 0 is 1. So boom, there you have it. Your first point, 3 comma 0 in polar form, which would put you at 1, 2, 3 with an angle measure of 0. And I don't know about you, but boy, I'm seeing the rose. The rose is just taken off. Well, I think we need some more points. So we're going to go to the next spoke. And I think this is going to be a really good lesson in why I like spokes of pi over 12. Sometimes they can backfire. They can really backfire if you don't have this coefficient in front, because then you're going to be forced to figure out the cosine of pi over 12, or maybe the sine of pi over 12, which isn't readily known by most people. But if you put a coefficient in front of it, this pi over 12 can be very versatile, because you can have a coefficient of 2 three, four, okay, maybe not five, six, all the way up to 12, and you're still going to be able to work with it very easily. And that's quite often what problems without calculator assistance was going to do anyway. So if we plug our pi over 12 in, we multiply it by three, we find out, whoa, that becomes a pi over four. And then we have to know that the cosine of pi over four is a one over square root of two. And I, and I think over overrated rationalizing the denominator is is not what we want to do here because I know that the square root of 2 and I always tell my students this is a good little piece of advice approximate that to be about 1.4 so that means that this is about 3 over 1.4 now 1.4 is close to 1.5 wish it was 1.5 because this would be a 2 would it not but because 1.4 is a little bit smaller that means that 3 over 1.4 is going to be a little bit bigger than 2. So that puts you right 1 and a teeny bit maybe outside of that second concentric circle. Still don't see a rose. Let's keep going. Let's go to 2 pi over 12, also known as pi over 6. We replace our pi over 6 uh, right here uh, into the theta. 3 times pi over 6 is pi over 12. And lo and behold, I'm sorry, I don't know what I'm doing here. 3 times pi over 6 is pi over 2. That's a lot better, isn't it? And we know that the cosine of pi over 2 is 0. And so, boom, that takes us right back here or to the pole for the first time. And I want to tell you something. In, for all intents and purposes, you could be done right now. If, let's say, the problem was to find the area of one of the petals, you kind of have built 
half of a petal at that stage. Now, you, you kind of have to understand what roses look like to really be confident enough with that, but that is exactly what's going on with this. Now, if we want to continue for a few more, I don't have a problem with that. So we have 2 pi over 6. Let's go to uh, uh, 1 pi over 12, 2 pi over 12, 3 pi over 12, also known as pi over 4. And if we throw that in, of course, we still have to multiply the pi over 4 by 3. Now we have something interesting. Cosine of 3 pi over 4. Now, one thing I know about that is we are now in quadrant number 2 right we're right here and remember all students take calculus which means cosine is going to be negative in that quadrant so we have 3 times negative 1 over square root of 2 also known as negative 3 over square root of 2 now again this is going to be pretty close to negative 3 over 1.4 which means this is going to be pretty close to negative 2 it's actually it's actually going to be a little smaller than negative 2. It's a larger magnitude number, which basically means that when we get to this spoke right here, we're talking about this guy right here all the way across, I'm going to be right there outside of that 2. So we've managed to go around to here. Now if we keep going, 1 pi over 12, 2 pi over 12, 3 pi over 12, 4 pi over 12, which is also pi over 3, 3 times cosine of 3 times pi over 3 is 3 times cosine of pi. We know the cosine of pi is negative 1. And boom, we notice that we're at negative 3, which puts us right here. Now, something magical is happening, and I think you're hopefully figuring it out. It seems like we're going to alternate between this number bigger than 2 to a number like 3 to a number bigger than 2 before we head back to the origin. And that's going to continue even more throughout this problem. Now notice, pi over 3 was this spoke right here. The next spoke here is what's going to give us that point. And the spoke here, which is pi over 2, is actually going to take us back to the pole. So I want you to equate being on this spoke, pi over 2, with returning back to the origin. Hopefully you see that 3 times pi over 2 cosine of that is going to be 0. But now if we move to one more spoke out, we're back to that number slightly bigger than 2. If we move yet another spoke out, we're at that value of 3. If we move another spoke, we're going to be at that number slightly bigger than 2 again. And then we go one more spoke, we're back to the origin. So notice what's happening here. Only two more spokes left to get back to pi. The first one is going to take us to that value slightly more than 2. And then when we get to pi, that's taking us back here to 0. Let's double check. If we let pi be here, 3 times cosine of 3 pi, well, we have to know that 3 pi is equal to, what does that look like? What? There's pi, there's 2 pi, 3 pi is going to be a negative 1, so yep, I am negative 3, and that's why when my angle is pi, I'm over here in the opposite direction at negative 3 and not at where a positive 3 would be in relation to pi. So bottom line is, we have this rose sketched already, and we notice that it has three petals, and we notice that it kind of, <coughs> excuse me, graphs its entire um, uh, appearance, let's say, from 0 to pi. If we kept going out to 2 pi, it would just graph itself over again. I want to take you on a little journey here to the graphing calculator to help you understand roses just a little bit better. So here we are. Everything's coming up roses. Let's go in and let's sketch this guy. Let's just double check and make sure that what we sketched earlier does pan out to be the polar curve. Remember we had 3 times the cosine of 3 times theta. And it probably won't come as a surprise that this graphs exactly what we thought. Oh, no, no, neat. It's a pink rose. That's exactly what we just discovered. Now, one thing I like to have my students think about is, why does this rose have three petals to it? Do you think it has to do with one of those numbers? And which of those numbers is the culprit that causes this rose to have three petals? A lot of great things to think about. Well, one of the things that I would like to do with this 
calculator is really experiment with this. And let's change these values from 3's to A's and B's so that we can invoke some slider settings. And I want A and B to be sliders. Now I'm going to change these settings just a little bit to be on minimum. And I'm going to actually change them really quickly to where they were before. There, that looks familiar, right? We had three and three for each of these. So what my point is, is what does the effect of the A have on the rows? Right now we keep it at three, but if I moved it up to four, do you all see that it just causes the petals to be a little longer? Four, five, et cetera, et cetera. And if I move backwards, I could make the petals be as small as one. Now, if I go to zero, obviously we know what that means, right? That means this thing is kind of non-existent. And yeah, you could let A be a negative value. It can happen. It just kind of causes the rows to sort of be symmetrical on the other side of the pole. Now, what about the B value? When we let B be three, we saw that this had three uh, petals. How about we take B up to be four? Well, that was kind of unexpected. We find that there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight petals. Very unpredictable. Let's take B to be five. Well, we're back to five petals. Okay, well, let's take this back to three. What if we were at two petals? What's your prediction? And the answer is four petals. And hopefully you see that when the B value is two or larger, if it's a negative, if, if it's an even number, you have two times the B value of petals. If the B is odd, you have exactly that number of petals. Three petals when B is three, eight petals when B is four. And I promise that that would continue for all values that are two or greater. Now, the other thing I wanted to point out, not all roses are cosines. What if we have our good friend, the sine rose? Same slider settings. I'll throw him in here. Let's see how he looks differently. Well, it may not be real obvious there, but if I dial B back down, maybe now you can see there is a the different kind of symmetry happening. The symmetry with the sine rose is such that this vertical axis now cuts the sine rose in half. Let's double check that back for the cosine rose. In the cosine rows, it's the horizontal axis that will cut the rows in half, which is fairly intuitive with your thinking of what the roles of sine and cosine are. Hopefully this helps out. We'd like to keep you around for our remaining videos. We only have a few more left over topic 9.7, but we're going to get into some pretty cool calculus stuff down the road. Thanks for joining. We'll see you next time.